Okay, well, today we're going to be talking about what's for dinner for rabbits. So, um, I think I've met most of you guys, but I'm Dr. Stephanie Lamb. I work here at Exotic Animal Care Center. Um, so, just to show you guys the talks that we've been having with our uh, Zoo Corner Rabbit Rescue Lecture Seminars. Last month we had, or two months ago, we had identifying and treating rabbit illnesses. Before that we had our basic rabbit care, and this time we're going over the ins and outs of diet with these guys. We have a few more interesting ones coming up to go through the full year. So, um, to start off with, when we're talking about diet, we do have to discuss that the rabbit gastrointestinal tract is quite different from mammals. Or, excuse me. They are mammals. <laughs> Quite different from us. <laughs> um, as everybody knows, rabbits are herbivores, so they are, um, you know, eating a lot of plant-based food. Whereas we are omnivores, and we're going to be eating not only plant-based food, but we're going to be eating animal-based products as well. These guys aren't really designed for it. So the other thing that makes them a little bit uh, interesting to deal with when we're talking about diet is they're called hindgut fermenters. And hindgut fermenters are animals that actually do a lot of um, food metabolism in the lower portions of their gastrointestinal tract. So I put a picture up here to show the gastrointestinal tract of a rabbit. You can see the mouth working its way down to the stomach, small intestines, and then all the way down here, the larger portion, that's the large intestines. And really, that's where a lot of um, digestion and absorption of nutrients is really happening in these guys. Yes, they do have digestion and absorption of nutrients further up in their small intestines, but a lot of it really is focused on the lower intestinal tract in these guys. So, why do we really care? so much about diet. Well, as obvious as it sounds, we have to eat if we want to live. So, um, we really, you know, know that diet, uh, really it's one of the most important factors that we can control in order to keep our rabbit friends and other small hindgut fermenter herbivores like guinea pigs and chinchillas happy and healthy. We can control that diet very easily and it can allow us to prevent issues, keep them healthy, but then also treat and manage any sort of problems that may arise. Now certainly there's many digestive, um, there are many issues that can arise that really don't get affected by changing or altering their diet, but when it comes to rabbits, a good portion of the problems that we deal with are brought about by dietary problems or ones that we can help when we adjust diet and focus on nutrition with them. Um, so if that is the case, then what do we really need to know about diet in order to help our pets out? Well, what I'm going to do with you guys today is we're going to basically be having a big lecture um, that really is kind of meant for biology students because we're going to go back to the basics and learn all the kind of important information about the basics of diet in order for us to understand it better so that we know what's appropriate to feed our rabbits and how we can help them with any nutritional issues that come up. So the basic components of a diet is going to consist of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals, and then of course water. Everybody always forgets water, but that's very important. Um, so all animal life does require these different components to varying degrees. It's no different for a rabbit versus a dog or a cat or a bird or a reptile, but the way that each individual animal sort of metabolizes and uses these different things is what makes them unique. So we're first going to go over carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are really the biggest area that we're going to talk about. Carbohydrates are your sugars. And so when we're talking about carbohydrates, I put up this little picture here in the corner. That is the molecular structure of glucose. So glucose is a single molecule of sugar. Um, there are other types of sugars that are out there. You know, you have fructose, galactose. Those are all single little units. 
And the purpose of your sugars is they're a source for energy. They are also really important for normal intestinal motility in the rabbit. And then there are factors about them that help to keep the rabbit's teeth nice and trim. So when we actually look at our carbohydrates, those carbohydrates can exist as one single little unit. So again, our little unit of glucose. And glucose really is the most common one that we talk about because it's the most, um, most utilized for life processes. When we're talking about a single unit of a sugar, then it's also known as a monosaccharide, just for guys is a little bit more information. Now what happens is we usually don't have just little single units of sugar just floating around. They like to join up together to make larger molecules. And so glucose and other monosaccharides like little molecules of fructose can join up together and they can make single or little um, products together called a disaccharide, so two little sugars stuck together, or polysaccharides like this structure here where you have a bunch of units of sugar all stuck together. So just some examples, um, maltose and sucrose are examples of some disaccharides, and then this big structure here, this is glycogen. So this is actually a storage product of glucose. You have a bunch of them all linked up together and stored in the body and in other things in life. So here's a picture of what glycogen looks like actually inside of a cell. So this picture up here, this is from a particular microscope um, that gets a lot of really good detail. And this is just one cellular unit. And all these little black clusters, those are all little clusters of glycogen. So clusters of sugar that are all just kind of being stored within that cell. To make things a little bit more complicated, um, the carbohydrates can basically go into two different groups. Carbohydrates can either be considered simple carbohydrates, which are also known as storage or non-structural carbohydrates, or complex carbohydrates, which are structural carbohydrates. So the storage or the simple carbohydrates, that's what we use as our main source of energy. So when we're eating our food and we're gaining energy from it, we are tending to gain energy from those simple carbohydrates. And rabbits do use simple carbohydrates as well, um, but it's not as important for them. What's much more important for them is going to be those complex or structural carbohydrates. Rabbits, that is where they get the majority of their energy from. About 40% of their energy actually comes from those complex or structural carbohydrates, whereas we really don't get much nutrition at all from those. We really do not utilize those. Um, and so just examples of what a simple carbohydrate is, well, glycogen is an example, starch, um, and then an example of a complex carbohydrate would be cellulose. And so when we think about plants, plants have a lot of cellulose in them, and that's what actually allows for your plant to be kind of this nice thick stem that stands up. It's all those complex carbohydrates in it that are linking it together and allowing for it to have a good, nice, strong structure to it. Now, really, what's the difference between a simple carbohydrate and a complex carbohydrate? It's really just the way they're stuck together. So when we looked at the pictures of the polysaccharide before, they were all kind of linked up together. And they can link up together in different ways. And the way that they link together is going to dictate whether it's a simple carbohydrate or a complex carbohydrate. So there are different bonds that exist, and there's one type of bond called an alpha bond. When you have an alpha bond between two little molecules of glucose, then you're going to get a non-structural carbohydrate, and you're going to get glycogen. Versus when you have a different type of bond called a beta bond, then it's going to link it up just slightly differently and turn it into a structural carbohydrate like cellulose. So to give you guys a picture of what that actually looks like, here's a simple starch. This is what's called that alpha linkage. So these two little molecules of glucose are stuck together and it makes them kind of line up kind of nice and straight across. Whereas down here, this is what's called a beta linkage. And so you notice they're really held together, um, bonding in just slightly different patterns. And it's that simple little bond difference that really makes 
all the difference for whether it's a structural or non-structural or simple or complex carbohydrate. And so just a couple other pictures just to kind of show how things link up together that all the molecules are actually the same thing. They're all just little individual molecules of glucose, but they link up differently and that's what makes the difference. So, well, okay, doesn't look like there's that much of a difference, but it really is important. And so the reason it's really important is because when we process these molecules and actually use them as a source of energy, it takes different types of enzymes to break apart those little bonds. And so mammals, humans, and rabbits do have enzymes that actually break down those alpha linkages very well. We're very good at processing those things so that we can get each individual little glucose molecule off and use it as an energy source. And the important enzyme that we have that allows us to do that is called amylase. Now, for those structural carbohydrates that have those beta linkages, mammals aren't really good at breaking those things down. Microbes, so things like bacteria, little fungi, protozoa, all those little organisms are actually really good at breaking down the bonds between um, those beta linkages. And so they use a specific enzyme called cellulase, and there's a few other ones as well, that they use to actually break things apart and utilize each individual little glucose molecule. So, mammals don't have that cellulase enzyme to break the structural carbohydrates account, <coughs> structural carbohydrates down. So, how do rabbits actually do it? Well, they have a bunch of little microorganisms that live in their gastrointestinal tract that do it for them. And though we have little microorganisms that live in our gastrointestinal tract too, we do not have the degree of microorganisms that they have. They have a lot more living little organisms in there that are really important to allow them to break down those structural carbohydrates so that they can actually then use that <laughs> structural carbohydrate, that hay, as an actual energy source. Okay, so just some examples of some um, those simple carbohydrates. They are going to be, again, that storage portion of a plant. And so things that um, we may feed our rabbits, oats, barley, um, we really shouldn't feed our rabbit too much corn or anything like that, but that is an example of a structural, or excuse me, non-structural or simple carbohydrate. And then of course things like fruits, carrots, wheat, all those things are examples of the simple carbohydrates, the more storage form of a carbohydrate. Versus the complex carbohydrates or the structural carbohydrates, um, those are going to be things like cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, and those things, again, they make up the cell wall of a plant, and they allow for it to have this nice, um, firm structure and allow it to give it shape so that you have your plants that can, you know, stand up and everything and be nice and straight and firm. And so examples are going to be grass hay and legume hay. So that's the carbohydrate portion, um, how things kind of work there with biology. The next important part of our diet is going to be proteins. And so proteins are made up of single individual little units um, called amino acids. And so up in the corner here we have a picture of all the different types of amino acids that are out there. There's 22 different amino acids that are required for life, and they are broken up into what's called essential and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are ones that an animal has to eat those from in their diet um, in order to get them, whereas non-essential ones, the body can actually make it on their on its own. So rabbits have 13 of those amino acids up there that are important for them to get from their diet because if they're not getting it from their diet, they can't make it on their own um, and they would then become deficient in those particular proteins or amino acids I should say. So amino acids are you know single individual little units. They're going to be very similar to our carbohydrates, how our carbohydrates bond together and make larger molecules. The same thing is happening with our amino acids. They bond together to make larger uh, protein structures. And so proteins are really important in many different functions. They work as enzymes, they work as hormones, they work in the immune system, they have structural components, so lots of different things that proteins are doing in our bodies. So 
different plants have different amino acid profiles. So you have your grass hays where 8 to 15 percent of that hay is actually going to be a protein. Um, alfalfa hay is much higher in protein and so it's going to be 17 to 23 percent. Now the other parts of the diet that we look at um, that can be in a rabbit's diet, so pellets, they are also a little bit higher than your grass hays and then grains as well, um, you know, pretty comparable to grass hays but slightly higher. Now the other thing to know is that when we're looking at plants, when that plant is going through different growing phases, it actually has different uh, nutritional profiles. So in a young plant, they have higher protein levels than older plants do. And then one thing um, that's unique to rabbits that's important to know is that their cecotrophs that they produce, that's an actual really important <coughs> source of protein. So the cecotrophs, those are produced in the cecum, um, they're the softer portion of the stool that often people are not seeing because the rabbits turn around and eat it right away. Those cecotrophs are not only providing vitamins and that people are often aware of, but they're also really providing a lot of protein for the rabbit as well. And they get a, a pretty good percentage of protein from those cecotrophs. 28 to 30 percent of that cecotroph is protein, which is a really high protein source. So very important for them to be eating it. Now, when we are looking at proteins, certainly if we have a rabbit who does not have a nutritionally balanced diet, we can run into deficiencies or we can run into excesses. And so deficiencies in proteins can lead to poor healing, um, poor tissue regeneration, you can have poor hair coats that are really dull, they can have wasting of the muscles. When rabbits have muscle wasting, they tend to lose muscle first along their hips and along their spine. So if you have a rabbit and you feel along their back or their hip region and it feels really bony, they may that may be because of a lot of protein loss or muscle loss, I should say, which can be due to protein deficiencies. Um, and then the other thing with protein deficiencies is it can lead to weight loss because the body recognizes that it doesn't have enough protein, it starts to metabolize a lot of stuff, um, and you can have the weight go down. Now, excesses of protein are you know, just as detrimental as deficiencies of protein for rabbits, but it results in kind of different problems. They can have alterations of the pH balance in their cecum, which can then lead to abnormal microorganisms in their gastrointestinal tract. And again, those gastrointestinal tract microorganisms are really important for them to be breaking down those um, structural carbohydrates in their diet. And so if they don't have appropriate organisms living in there, then it could lead to some problems. And then it's also possible that protein excesses could lead to, could lead to a strain on organs like the liver and the kidneys. The next important part of the diet, um, we went over carbohydrates, proteins, now we're on to fats. And so fats, there's a variety of different kinds of fats out there. There's monoglycerides, diglycerides, triglycerides, there's sterols, fatty acids. Fats have several important functions. They are an important source of energy. Um, when the body has excess fats around um, and it kind of burns through its stores of carbohydrates that it has, then it will switch and start using fats as, a, as an energy um, source. Fat is really important as well for insulating organs. It's important in inflammatory processes. It can reduce the absorption of calcium, which in certain circumstances we do know that rabbits are very good at absorbing calcium from their diet, so in certain circumstances it may be beneficial to have a reduction in the amount of calcium that's absorbed. It is very important for necessary absorption of certain vitamins. Uh, there are certain fat-soluble vitamins that really don't get absorbed very well if you don't have fats in the diet. And those are going to be vitamins A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. Fats are also really important as hormones, and then they are important for the the health of the skin and the coat as well. So, with deficiencies in fat, 
we will see poor gut motility, we'll have dull coats, um, you can have deficiencies in those different fat soluble vitamins, so you can see vitamin A deficiencies, vitamin D, vitamin E or vitamin K deficiencies, rabbits will be slower to recover from injuries if they don't have enough fat in their diet, babies will not grow as effectively and as rapidly, and then you can also lead to brain and nerve development problems. So if you're not getting enough fats as a young animal, then you may have poor brain development. Excesses. Certainly everybody knows excesses of fat can lead to things like obesity, but there are other problems that we can see as well. There's a condition called hepatic lipidosis. What that is, is that's fat that's accumulated within the liver. Oftentimes that disorder comes about because of an animal, one, having too much fat in its diet, but two, when a, you have a rabbit that is not eating very well, the body starts to mobilize a lot of fats because the body recognizes that, oh, we don't have enough energy right now, we have to take all those stores of energy that we had, and they start moving a lot of fats around and basically can kind of clog up that liver with a lot of fat, and then the liver just doesn't function as well as it should. Other problems that we see, there's a condition called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a condition where you get essentially hardening of blood vessels. And when you have hardening of blood vessels, blood vessels, it's very important for them to be kind of pliable and able to kind of move um, to allow for blood to be propelled through the vascular system. When those blood vessels get hard, they aren't as able to contract and push blood through as nicely um, and you can have several different vascular problems occur. And then we also know it can lead to insulin resistance. The good thing is, is we don't really see um, diabetes issues in rabbits so often. Occasionally there have been some um, cases of it reported in rabbits, but it's actually more of a problem in the animal world in cats. So luckily in the world of rabbits we typically don't have to deal with that, but it is something that could always become a problem if we had an animal that was on too much or had too much fat in its diet. So the next portion of the diet that we have to have appropriate for our little buns is going to be our vitamins and minerals. Vitamins and minerals have also lots of important functions. They are going to function as coenzymes and what that means is you have your different enzymes in your body that are doing different functions and several vitamins and minerals actually work with those enzymes to allow for those enzymes to do their exact job that they need to do. Um, maintaining normal cell function, they help in clotting the blood, in growth, and immune function, they have antioxidant properties. I put up the types of vitamins. There's the fat soluble vitamins, which we already talked about vitamin A, D, E, and K. And then we have our water soluble vitamins. B complex, there are lots of different B vitamins out there, so we usually just say B complex because that incorporates all the different B vitamins. And then vitamin C. Water soluble vitamins, you can have large amounts of them and not result in any problems, whereas fat soluble vitamins, if you have too many of those, you can result in nutritional excesses and have issues. I put up a list of the different minerals that are important for life. So, um, and what all these minerals are, these are represented by their actual, when you look at a periodic table of elements, these are the symbols for the different minerals based on that periodic table. Yes? Um, are there any other type of vitamins other than those up there? Um, <coughs> oh, so like those things that we have up there, yes, there are other vitamin options than what's up there. Those that are up there, um, those are produced by the Oxbow Company. They do have different uh, properties. There are some vitamins in those, but there's other things as well. And each of those different products has like a different function, essentially. You have your gastrointestinal support, you have your um, GI support, urinary support ones, and so each of them has a little bit of different nutritional profile, and they're not, they're certainly not um, complete in the different vitamins and minerals that an animal needs. Are there so. any other ones that you can just buy? Yes, there are other ones that you can just buy. Now the thing is, is I usually don't recommend so much of a vitamin or mineral supplement for rabbits. And the reason I don't is because when you have your pellet, your you know, your rabbit pellet as a portion of the diet, that really is functioning as the supplement really 
for your vitamins and minerals. Now, if we have a rabbit with a particular disorder where they may need a little bit more of some sort of vitamin or mineral, then we may prescribe that individually and say, okay, this rabbit needs this particular vitamin more, so I want you to go to the store and pick up you know, vitamin C or what have you um, to supplement and get a little bit extra of that. But yes, you can get uh, vitamins as vitamins and minerals as a full, like, you know, here's your one little pill of it, or you can actually get it individually so that you get just get just what you need and you're not running into nutritional excesses by getting too much of something else, too. Right. So, so those shouldn't be given as a preventative? They're, they have different functions, and so the urinary support, if you have a rabbit that has urinary tract issues, the urinary support one may be beneficial for them. But if you have a rabbit that doesn't has never had any urinary tract issues, then you may not really need something like that, you know? Like even the digestive one, uh -huh. immune, but just like as a preventive. Yeah, and so those those two in particular are fine because the thing is the digestive support one. Well, we know a lot of rabbits have digestive issues. It's one of the most common things or common disorders that we see in rabbits. So, you know, that one is okay to be giving. And then the immune support, sure. I mean, it's just making sure that we have a good, healthy, functioning immune system. So again, that one as well is okay to be giving. So. And the thing is, if you were giving the urinary support one, you probably wouldn't be running into any issues, but it's a matter of do you really need to give it to your rabbit because is it really necessary for your rabbit? So. Okay, so, but of all those different nutrients that we talked about, there's one we have yet to talk about, mm -hmm. the most important nutrient of all. And it's water. <laughs> a lot of people forget about how important water is. Water really is the most important nutrient. Um, it is required for appropriate hydration for, you know, pretty much every function in the body. Uh, lots of different cellular activities, adequate blood flow, you name it. So that little bunny there is having a nice sip from a little sippy cup there on a warm day. <laughs>